not saying anything. Either. All right. Let's just um, open up in prayer. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity to discuss your word. Sit around your Torah with like-minded people. Father, through your spirit, speak to us, reveal to us what you want to us to know, and help us to prepare for your coming. Ask all the mighty name of Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are in Parasha Vayetze. So I um, highlighted two letters there. Anyone want to say anything about it that come to mind? The Vav and the Aleph and what is inside. Tariq? Is it Tariq in the middle? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, Tariq Yo. Is it a word? Not really. Not it's symbolism. Because Aleph and Men are both sides of the. And which side is which? Left is spiritual. Or no, is left is physical. Physical and left is spiritual. No, left is. Physical right is spirit. <laughs> and who's on the <coughs> now you swapped it a bit. So who's on the right hand side? The Vav. So Vav is now on the right hand side. And we see the Aleph on the left hand side. And the Aleph represents Yahweh. So they switch places. Now we had the same picture. Two Torah portions ago. Can you remember that one? This one is He went out. That one's name is He appeared. Vayera. No, Vayera. It was Vav Yod Resh Aleph. And this one is the encounter of Jacob with Yahweh and that one was the encounter of Abraham with Yahweh mm -hmm. and we see the same right. pattern of the Vav and Aleph changing places so Aleph came down to the physical and man was elevated into the spiritual through being able to see into the spiritual or experience what's in the spiritual and what's in the middle is the what is happening as a result of that? So that's just an introduction. Mm. All right, so this week, Genesis 28 to 31, it's all about Jacob, his dream, Rachel, then he's being deceived by his uncle Laban, and then he married both daughters at the end of the day. Then he had enough, he fled after 20 years. And then Laban chased him down and they made a covenant. The end. So this week we are going to spend a lot of time in Genesis 28. So just for the sake of my lovely wife, I had two slides to recap. <laughs> the reason I've got this one in here is because we are going to reference this word struggled, ratatz. And what you'll note there is the double tzaddik. And that double tzaddik relates to the word vayetze. It's got a tzaddik in the middle. And that's the connection. So the theme of this Torah portion is actually the brokenness of Yaakov. That is the, the purpose of the things that he went through. Now my name is Yaakov as well. Philip, my second name is Jacob, Jacob is Jacob, same, same thing. And in my nature, I'm a schemer as well. <laughs> and I'm conniving in my past life. Um, that's why last time I said I was not the perfect person because of those attributes. But in my walk, Yahweh changed me through accessing the Torah and my name changed or my character changed as a result of that. So this is a very personal connection. Even the connection between 
Jacob and Esau and his brother told him, I will go and hunt you down and kill you after our father died. My brother told me exactly the same words and he's not a believer. Isn't that interesting? Yes. So my life is following Yaakov's life. And I also had to flee to another country. That's why I'm here. And that was in that time after that that we left and came here. So you didn't fear your brother? Well, it wasn't fear, but it's just the threat was there. Yeah. And I, I believed him because he's, um, yeah. he's capable. <laughs> so no discredit to him whatsoever. I don't mm -hmm. think he would have done it. But it's just fascinating to know that, that whatever's in the Bible happened in my real life as well. So, yeah, you learn a bit more about me when you read about this bloke <laughs> in, in, in the Torah. All right. So the brokenness and to crack into pieces and to break Yaakov is the key to changing Yaakov to be someone good. Because the starting point is not a good starting point. If I look at my life, I had to be broken man before I could basically change. And it wasn't my choice. Oh, I, I think I'm horrible. Oh, it's Monday. I think I'll, I'll change. No, it wasn't like that. You just keep on what you're doing and then things happen. And then as a result of what happened, you become a broken man, broken person. And then you pick yourself up and Yahweh allows you to to reflect on that and then to learn from your mistakes and access the Torah and that change you. Um, this one is just focusing again on the birthright, the theme of the birthright. We're going to just carry that on throughout this study with the focus on the letter bet. We are going to find that in various places. And the bet in this context is the household. And what we saw from last week's teaching is that the covenant was given to an individual. The individual became a family. The covenant within the context of a family is called the birthright. And now the birthright can be accessed within a family unit. Now the family unit or the household or the house is now being opened up and other people can join this house, which is the house of Israel. So Israel is not being replaced by the church. Israel is still Israel. It's the vehicle for the collect collective of the nations or the collection of the nations within a family unit and that family unit or assembly we find that in the Torah portion as well is called Yisrael and it will always be called Yisrael and if you read Revelation mm -hmm. we will enter into the 12 gates of the names of the tribes of Yisrael mm -hmm. Israel will exist until the end mm -hmm. uh, outside of time in the new kingdom Israel will still exist and Israel is the means for the nations to come in based on the promise that was given to Abraham so that the nations can come in those as the sand of the sea and those as the stars in heaven are the priestly function who are chosen to have a greater responsibility to facilitate the process for the sand of the sea to come in inside this big letter bet or the house of Yahweh. Now we're going to look at the letter bet in context of Jacob's ladder today. And that relates to the presence of Yahweh. So we're going to see that as well. All right, let's look at Genesis 28, verse 10 to 11. Jacob went out from Bathsheba, went towards Haran. And he light, lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he looked for stones of that place and he put them or his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. So this is the place where he had the encounter. But before we jump onto that, I just want to recap what I said in the beginning with some visuals. So the previous, this Torah portion is Vayetze with Yod Tzadik in the middle, in between the Vav Aleph, that means he went out. Previous Torah portion is Vayera, we have the Yod Resh. So the only difference between the two words is the resh and the tzadik. Mm -hmm. Resh means head or leader, and tzadik means righteousness. And if you can combine the two, it's the leader is righteous, 
and if you put the hand on the head it's a function of the anointing which was Abraham's anointing Abraham's anointing was passed on to Isaac Isaac passed it on to Jacob now Jacob's got the Yod Resh as part of the birthright but now he's going to get a Yod Tzadik so the first encounter of the Yod and the Resh of Abraham that passed on through the birthright is a form of being righteous he's now part of the priestly function but he's going to get his own encounter that will be on top of the birthright which is another hand on a righteous person which give him a double portion of righteousness now he's double righteous but the double righteousness is not only deserved by putting hand on head it is through the brokenness of Yaakov that he will receive his second tzaddik and that second tzaddik is manifested in his second encounter with Yahweh where he wrestled with Yahweh and where his name was changed his destiny was changed to Yisrael so he already had the birthright and now he's got the opportunity to get another portion or another anointing a double anointing but that he has to earn through brokenness for that double anointing to fully manifest because the old man need to be completely die for the second righteousness to fully feature so you have to kill the person in order to resurrect them again and that's where the concept of born again comes in as well and then they can be part of Israel so that's where the idea of being born again comes from is the brokenness of Yaakov is the death to the old nature the old man you need to be resurrected by the spirit that's the hand on the tariq and then you get, get the double righteousness which is the anointing of the household or the people functioning within the household of Israel through the anointing of the spirit and that's where you get the gifts of the spirit and the fruit of the spirit that facilitate the priestly function within the house so all of this set the stage for what we know that is recorded in the Brit Harsha, the New Testament. It's all founded upon the double tzaddik. And we're going to see more hints about this with the concept of Christianity or Christians or followers of Messiah. And the anointing of Messiah is the second anointing that is placed upon. And that's actually the spirit of Yahweh that indwell his people after they receive the birthright, which is becoming born again. That's why I said you get baptized by water and by fire. The second baptism is that second tzaddik that make you that um, holy person. Um, Yaakov or Jacob is Yod Ayan Kuf Bet. Now what we see in his name, we, we have the letter Bet, which is household. We've got the letter Kuf, who knows what Kuf means. That's a monkey. You have to contain the monkey. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the double brokenness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in this case, it's more relevant as a monkey. Mm -hmm. It also means to turn the head. And to contain the monkey is to turn the head. And turn the head is not done for repentance. You repent from being a monkey. Mm -hmm. And now you, through evolution, you become that. You know? <laughs> Through the spirit of Yahweh, you get a new nature and you become more like Adam, which is the restored Adam. And then you have the iron. Now, the iron is normally negative when it's on the left because it's a fleshly eye desiring fleshly things. But when the iron moves to the right, what do you think that means? When your eye moves to the right, yeah, you see in the spirit, you see spiritual things, mm -hmm. you discern spiritual things, and that's the concept of the word re'e, that means insight mm -hmm. or spiritual understanding. You've got a deeper understanding of Yahweh's things, you understand his ways, you understand his character, and you understand your purpose and your role and your function within the household. That's that insight, that revelation that happens. And this is the, the yod upon the iron that we see in his name is that opening of the spiritual eye so he can contain his monkey and allow the house to be coming into fruition in his life his name means heel catcher and supplanter which is a negative um, it comes from the root akav that means heel and that's 
adding the hand, which is yoked on the heel, is through the symbolism, you catch her, just looking at the Hebrew letters. Now, Yaakov has the commentary of 182, that means he'll catch a supplanter, supplanter breach in the form of breach baby, where you nearly die. So maybe his mother had a difficult birth. It was in my life because I'm a Yaakov. Myself and my mum nearly died at my birth. So that's also evident in my life. Then you have cleft which is large cracks in the ground, dug over, and I looked at the Hebrew to know what, what does this mean. It means a field broken up as if it's plowed and prepared for seed. Now, now you can see the brokenness of Yaakov is to break the ground so that Yahweh now can sow the seed. So if you go through a very tough time, you feel you've been smacked down and you're nothing, now your ground is being plowed. Now Yahweh can come and sow the seeds. And then his fruit will grow. And you will bear fruit from the seeds that he planted in your life. And that's the fruit of his spirit and the anointing and gift of his spirit. Very symbolic of the brokenness. And then the positives are offspring and produce. And that's exactly in the physical. He had a large offspring and he became the nation of Israel. But also the offspring and produce on a spiritual sense, in a spiritual sense, where he produced spiritual fruit, where he became the spiritual leader and led his family in the ways of Yahweh. And that's what that transformation process as a result of the brokenness in his life means. Okay, next one, Genesis 28, verse 1 to 2. And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Why do you think he said that? Because Esau took wives mm -hmm. from the daughters. Is it Canaan or Egypt? Mitzrayim. And he also took a wife from the daughters of Ishmael. And Ishmael was an offspring of an Egyptian woman. So, through the wrong of his brother, Isaac warned Jacob not to walk in the footsteps of his brother and take a wife from within the household which is the extended household through Rebecca's brother. There's also the words that um, Abraham charged his servant when he went out to find a wife for Isaac. He said, don't go to, don't take it from Canaan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's sort of part of the, the birthright. Mm. It's like a little fence or a warning. You'll be blessed and all of those things. But on top of that, don't take a wife from the Canaanite people. So it's to keep the, the, the household pure and the offspring pure. Right, then also the reason why Jacob left is because um, Rebecca advised him to flee to Haran, Haran because of Esau's promise to kill Jacob after the death of his father. And his father became ill and then he decided to flee. Now Esau means hairy. Ayan Shin Vav. Now what you see here is the Shin is in the center. And if that is applied wrong, that can mean a very feisty or fiery personality. And the Vaf is on the left, that means man, so he's a man in the flesh or on the fleshy side of things. But he still had an iron on the right, which is the potential to see, but he chose not to see. And that's why he followed the flesh and had his feisty personality that threatened his brother after he lost the birthright. Now Esau 
as the Gematria 376. That means hairy, Esau, retribution, punishment, vengeance, their blackness, desire. And this is basically Esau's blackness of his heart due to the contention over the birthright and his drive to take retribution and vengeance um, because of uh, what Jacob did. Now then we see the mercy and the grace of Yahweh in Esau's name. So there's a potential for him to come to faith because cry for help, request to lend aid, to help Sparrow and then we see reward, welfare, rich wealth, completeness and peace. So when you repent and you cry for help, Yahweh is willing to lend a hand and then allow them to engage and be part of the reward and to be made complete and enter into his peace or enter into his rest. So it's not woe to all if you're not like Jacob and followed Yahweh. He did the opposite. He was a total rebel. He did everything that the family said, do not do. He did that. He was a total rebel. And yet, Yahweh still has within his name, and the gematria of his name, the potential to be made complete. The potential to enter into his rest if he cry out and repent. So that is the, the, the criteria for Yahweh's grace to be activated within those people. So they won't just go to hell if they repent, even if it's the last minute. If you cry out like the thief on, on the cross next to Yeshua, you can enter into the kingdom because you're part of the last of the laborers and you get the same wage regardless of whether you're first or last as long as you repent and cry out. And that's that letter Kuf. Also, I find that one of the commandments is honor your father and mother. Mm. And Esau was diabolically opposed to his father and mother to the woman that he married. Mm. Mm. Yeah. He deliberately went out. And I said to him, Don't do this. He went out and took Egyptian women. Mm. And he went and took um, other women because he had more than one wife. Yeah. All right, so Jacob then went to his uncle Laban. Now Laban means white. Esau means red. It's associated with Edom. So basically Jacob went from a place of red to a place of white. So his circumstances changed from being a man of the field or associated with people that are part of the world, associated with people who are striving towards whiteness or holiness. I'm not saying here that Laban was holy, mm -hmm. but it's a symbolism within his name. It's so almost like <clears throat> the red is like he had a, um, an earthly battle mm -hmm. with Esau, and then with Laban it's mm -hmm. like a spiritual Yes, battle. that's like, right. And, uh, that's his next challenge. Mm -hmm. First is with the flesh and the earthly things. Mm. And when you overcome, you'll have struggles within your walk and, and mm. strive towards holiness. Mm. Yeah, that, that's a good insight. Mm. Now, when you look at the word words Edom and Laban, and you take the first two letters, it makes the word El, which is short form of Elohim. Mm. So that show you within your battles, the fleshy battles, and within your, your spiritual battles. Elohim is always present and he's your helper that you will take you through your process of being broken and up to the point where you become complete and being at peace with Yahweh. All right, you shall not take away. Same verse. Um, so Jacob left and he went to his grandfather. Bethuel, that means daughter of Elohim. It also means Elohim destroys, man of Elohim, and dweller in Elohim. So there's multiple meanings. And what we can see here is that initially Jacob probably felt like Yahweh is against him. Elohim is going to destroy him through the threat. He had to flee. 
And then he became a dweller in Elohim. He just followed what Yahweh told him. And in his walk, he became a man of Elohim. And later on, he will become a daughter of Elohim, which is the picture of the bride, where he became Israel. That's exactly what Torah does, isn't it? When you, when you start walking in Torah, that changes your character. And then you become a man of Elohim, a man with your daughter. Yeah, as long as you walk in Elohim. How do you walk in him? Paul says we need to be in Christ. Now I know that Christians know the discredit to them or saying it with respect. They don't know what it means to be in Christ, to be in Messiah. Mm. They think it's, I don't know, it's a, it's a weird concept. Mm. It's more like he's my protection kind of thing. Mm. But if you're in him, who is he? Oh, he's the Torah, he's the word. Can I be in the Torah? Yes, I can. Can I walk in him? Can I walk with him? And that's basically making sense when you change this meaning from Messiah to the living Torah. And then it becomes practical. So if you strip away the attributes of Torah from Messiah, then you're in him only uh, based on the little few verses that you memorized mm -hmm. and that you quote in whatever situation you're in. And there's so much more than having those few verses on your mirror in the morning that you try and memorize. You need to study the Torah, get that into your system. You don't have to quote any verses, mm -hmm. you know, to understand the intent and the nature that is in Torah so you can actually practically walk in it, not quoting verses left, right and center for your protection. All right, Haran. It's actually the word Haran, it's a Chet, Resh, Nun. And it means mountaineer. It has to do with elevation. Now, who was a mountaineer? Who was the first mountaineer? Moses. No, he was the second one. Who was the first one? Abraham. Abraham. So um, Noah ended up on the top of Noah was another mount. He was actually the first one. <laughs> because he ended up top of Mount Ararat. Mm -hmm. The mountain, when him and um, his Lot, was Lot? Lot and um, oh, Abraham. Lot and Abraham. When they separated, Lot went down to where the beautiful paradise area was. And he went up to the mountainous areas, the dry places. And that's comparing yourself with what is on high which is yahweh and getting or dealing with your flesh or go down to the place where the flesh will flourish and you compare yourself with people the edomites people of the flesh and then your holiness in relation to fleshy people is much lower than your holiness in context of yahweh standards mm -hmm. and that's the concept of the mountaineer and of course, Moses is the other one who went up several times. Mm -hmm. And the context of climbing a mountain is, it's not easy because gravity is against you. Everything's against you. It's an effort. It's hard. It drains you physically. It's lonely because it's only you who go up. You don't have a following. They will drop out. When Yeshua went out to, up to pray, they parked halfway and he went up. Mm. It's too hard. Only one who made it, Moses, and then Yeshua. Mm. It's it's hard and lonely. It's an effort. And that's what that second tzaddik is about. That extra bit of effort to step up uh, your holiness for the benefit of the people. Because when you come down, your face is shining. You radiate. Yahweh's glory and your overflow of your relationship now feeds the people, give them insight. And that's why it's important to have that high level of relationship mm -hmm. for the benefit of others. And we can see that it's a letichet on the right, and that has to do with life, entering life. Resh, of course, is leader. And the nun, nun sufit, 
It's like an enlarged vav. It's also called the crowned vav, mm. which is a form of an elevated vav or a vav that is anointed above other vavs. And that's a symbolism of Mashiach and little Mashiach, so those who are anointed ones with him. And we see that in the Nun Sufit that now operate in the left or in the physical. So that's where Jacob went, is to become a mountaineer, to get the life source, be a leader, and bring it down as an anointed person for the benefit of others. Bersiva is um, consisting of two words. It means vow of sevenfold oath. And it, it consists of two words. The first one is Be'ar, and Shaba Be'ar means abundance, and the number seven. No, it's not. Shiva means number seven. I think I got it wrong there. To be satisfied, to be complete, well or pit, to make clear and to declare. Now, we are going to look at the well, because that's where Jacob's going to meet his wife. To make things clear and to declare, to be satisfied in abundance, relates to Yahweh's word. And now we see the concept of the number seven being introduced here. Can you remember what number seven means in relation to all of that? No, it's completion. Yes, it's an oath, it's completion. But in relation to creation, it's a cycle. Number one to seven and starts again, number one to seven starts again, one to seven. And on day seven is where your cleansing happens. It's cleansing cycles. You engage with the Torah on number seven. And then you go through six, you engage with Torah on number seven. Number seven keeps you sane, keeps you pure, and builds your level of holiness. And this is what we do today. We now have our number seven cleansing cycle. Just press pause, spend time with Yahweh, focus, reflect back on the previous six, get energy and focus to face the next six of the next cycle. And that's what we do on the higher scale, seventh millennium. And then you get the next one, the larger and the small. Your focus is always on the seven, isn't it? But when you're in six, you focus always on man. When you're number seven, you focus on the oath, the covenant, and you always think. Yeah, but what I mean is... Um, yeah, we're supposed I'm, to. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah I'm, you're always looking forward. So with that in mind, those six, one, two, three, four, five, and six, your focus should actually be on the seven. Yeah. <coughs> isn't it? Yeah. Anticipating. Anticipating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which you do on a weekly basis because you should have, yeah. yeah. And then you have strength to face number eight, which is new beginning or the new cycle starting with number one. Mm, that's right. And this whole concept is now introduced with Yaakov mm. and the place he went in the cycles of seven that relates to Sabbath, but also the seven Moedim. Now we have Yahweh's cleansing cycles. The basis of the foundation, which is within the Torah, the Moedim, has now been established through these two words. Mm -hmm. So we got the concept of Messiah, little Messiah's Christianity, the household, and now we see the Moedim. So the Moedim is created for the household. That's why it says Sabbath is created for man. Mm -hmm not man for the Sabbath, because the Sabbath is the cleansing cycle for man. Mm -hmm. It benefits man. Yeah. If you don't keep it, you will not be cleansed. Right. If you're not cleansed, it means that you will suffer in your filth, mm -hmm. which is your sin, bondage, and struggles. Mm -hmm. So it's good to go through these cleansing cycles. So what we see here, is that Yahweh has now introduced the covenant, the birthright, the household that exists within the, or, or the concept of the birthright, the anointed people, allowing other people in. But now he's introducing another mechanism within this household 
that is all founded upon the foundation of the covenant, the birthright, and the house of Elohim. And that is the cycle. So those who are now entering into this house, which will be created through Yaakov, becoming Israel, which will benefit all nations, means that all nations will have access to the covenant, his Torah, his well, his water, to have clarity on that, as well as the cleansing cycles, the Sabbath and the Moedim. Mm. And if you say the Sabbath, the Moedim, and the Torah has been done away with, you might as well just break out all the walls, the roof, everything, there's an empty shell standing, and it's mm. worthless. Mm. That house is completely empty, it's got no furniture in it, doesn't even have walls or roof or nothing. Mm. It's just a framework that represents resembles a house but it's not a house the way it's supposed to be constructed so you can't annul things you can't abolish things it's like breaking down the house of yahweh destroying the foundation which is his torah and his covenant and throwing away the furniture which i is a moedim it doesn't have any purpose or meaning anymore and then the nations walk there and they're not interested in entry because it won't benefit them because it's nothing it's empty you're not full of tooth, and you take it. You are unclean if you're not cleansing with the word. The word is a cleansing thing, it washes you clean. So if you're not keeping that word, you are not washing the old nature off. And the only way you can wash that off is with the new, with the, with the word. Yeah. With the Torah. Yeah, that's the only way to change Yaakov to Israel, or to become part of the house of Israel. So, the main thing I want to underline here is that the covenant is the same thing as the birthright, is the same thing as the Torah, is the same thing as the commandments. If you abolish the Torah and the commandments, you're abolishing the covenant. If you abolish the covenant, restoration to become a restored Adam cannot happen. And the work of Messiah is, for, uh, is useless, can't do it, mm -hmm. because his work is done within the cycles of the Moedim. If you abolish that, there's nothing. You can't even recognize the Messiah anymore, because he revealed himself, because he came and do, did the work mm -hmm. on a timely manner within those timestamps mm -hmm. of the cycles of seven. Mm -hmm. So don't be foolish, oh you Galatians. Mm -hmm. Genesis 28, verse 11 to 15. And he took a stone from the place, put it under his head, and he lay down there to sleep. He dreamt that there before him was a ladder resting on the ground with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of Yahweh were going up and down on it. And suddenly Yahweh was standing there next to him and said, I'm Yahweh, the Elohim of Abraham your grandfather and the Elohim of Isaac. The land on which you are laying, I will give to you and your descendants. And your descendants will be numerous as the grains of the dust of the earth. You will expand to the west and the east and north and south. And, and by you and your descendants, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Look, I'm with you. I will guard you wherever you go. I will bring you back unto this land because I won't leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So this is something that Yahweh confirmed with underlining it with the fact that he promised it, he will get it done. He's not putting the emphasis on your faith or your abilities or whatever. Because then it won't work. Yahweh doesn't need us to bring his plan into fruition. He will do it because of his promise that he did. And if someone decline and doesn't follow him, he will use someone else. But he will fulfill his purpose because he said it and he will do it. And he's not a liar. He promised it and he will do it. And if you standing on the covenant, you can have that assurance that Yahweh swore by himself that this will happen. No man 
no man's disobedience, no man's sin will ever stop this. He will bring it to pass. And that's why when he say that all the families of the earth will be blessed, what do you think that means in the larger context? Let's think about after the smoke clears. Who are all the families of the earth? No, it's only, only two billion. The other seven billion burns in hell. They burn in hell. Does it make sense? When he promised it, he swore by himself that all the families of the earth will be blessed. What's it, what does that mean? Just another confirmation. Yeah. And he didn't say, no, they have to have faith in me and all this and that, and then they will be blessed. No. Yes, that is part of it, but he will not stop until all the families will be blessed. And he will do numerous cycles, whatever you need to do. Many times he says, he says, it's not for your sake that I'm doing this. It's, it, it's for my name's, for my name's sake yeah. because I made this covenant for you, exactly. which you broke. Yes. But I won't break it. Mm. I won't break it. Yeah. And that's a symbolism of Abraham fast asleep and he confirming the covenant with himself because he know man will break it. And those who are asleep like Abraham are those who are asleep who didn't make it, but he will take the effort and give him another opportunity so that all families can be blessed. Just a little side note there. So when he started this conversation, he identified himself as Yahweh, Elohim of Abraham, Elohim of Isaac, and in this case, he's now revealing him as Elohim of Jacob. Now it's easy to say, specifically children, when they grow up in the faith, oh, my parents, they've got a relationship with Yahweh. I know someone who's got a relationship with Yahweh, but do you have one? No, I know someone who does. You need to make it a personal relationship. And this is basically putting the emphasis on you need to have a personal relationship with Yahweh, your Elohim. And Yahweh, your Elohim, need to reveal himself to you personally. That's Yahweh's intent of making a covenant with man is to have a personal relationship with every single member of all the families of the earth. That's his intent. He's not distant. He's not the big guy upstairs. He's not the universe or whatever the New Age is calling. He's a real person with awesome power that wants to reach down to us and reunite us back unto him so we can have that echad relationship, that oneness with him. What we also see here is that he only repeated the part that has to do with the sand of the sea. He didn't repeat the part which is the stars of heaven. Because the function that Yaakov, Yaakov has is to bring people in that are in the world, which are at the sea, the people who are lost. They need to come in. And he's going to use the vehicle called Yisrael to bring them in. Now the house or the bet, the household, they are the stars that you can't count. They are the anointed ones, the ones with the priestly function, with the double tzaddik. They will have the anointing to facilitate the process to bring the sand of the sea in, which is the purpose of being saved. You are not saved to be a little star and twinkle, twinkle. Play a little harp. No, you've got a function. You are anointed for a purpose and to bring the sand of the sea into the household. And that's why we exist as believers of Mashiach, having faith in him, is to bring people into the kingdom. All right, so we see the word stone and ladder. So I want to emphasize those two things because they are two objects. The one is the physical object, the other one is the spiritual object, or an object that reach into the spiritual. Now the stone is the word Eben, and it comes from the root um, Bana, that means to build. Now, if you think about what Yeshua said in Matthew 16, 
You are Peter, and upon this rock or stone, I will build, which is Bana, my assembly or my household. Mm. We see exactly the same language that is emphasis or uh, intended of transforming Yaakov into Yisrael. He becomes a small family. Now he becomes a nation or a, a big household. And that is something that is going to be built. So that means it will increase in size. Where he says, enlarge your tents. Mm. So more people can come in, come in. So that's part of that prophecy as well. Now what you'll see here with Eben, you've got the letter Bet, you've got Aleph, and you've got Nun. We already talked about the Nun. We talked about the Bet. We've got Aleph, and that's Yahweh's presence. What's also interesting about the word Eben, or stone, it's the combination between the two words Av, which is father, and Ben, that is son. So this stone is the symbolism of the father and the son, and he's putting his head in the presence of the father and the son. So that is where the anointing is now coming upon the tariq within this um, Torah portion. When he actually arrives at um, Jerusalem, he's going to <clears throat> that passage makes a big deal out of the stone being large over the well. And yeah. It's, it's, it just kept, it was so many times that I counted it as five times that it mentions the stone on that well. Yeah. And it, you think, oh, this, you know, makes it come there. Obviously, I forgot about the well, head on the stone too. So he's arriving at a place. Yeah. Yeah. Also, can you take it that the, 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 the stone over the well was a symbolism of the stone which is going to be rolled away? Yeah. There's just so much that goes into this story. It just goes on like forever and ever and ever. When he went there, he went to the place where his grandfather, Abraham, Abraham set up an altar. He put those stones around for a pillar. Must have been at the altar. Mm -hmm. When he saw that, when he had that um, dream of heaven, it, it, there was so much. It's all about stone, stone. It's all about stone. the stone. The stone, the ball that rejected. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, this first stone he put his head on, then the stone, he made a pillar. Mm. Then the stone on the well that's connected to water. Mm. Then Israel traveled through the wilderness. Water came out from the stone, mm. symbolizing the well with the stone mm. covering the water. And then the stone of the grave being opened up because the stone covered the grave. And then the one with the living water came out of the grave. Mm. Same symbolism. Mm. Yeah. And then the stone that will come and crash, crush the feet of this kingdom and at the end. What you brought out this morning was there were three groups at that well to feed the cattle. And those three groups are the three groups of what you've got in the world today. The stone will not be removed until all the cattle were there, all the sheep were there. So it's symbolic of all the nations. Yes. They've got to be gathered mm. together before the stone can be removed. And they can be watered. Yeah. That's a function of the household or the bed or the assembly that um, Peter represented. Yeah. So you see that the foundation of the New Testament being laid here with the symbolism of Jacob's ladder and the symbolism of the stone. Very, very strong. <coughs> um, you also see the within Bana, that means to build, you get the bed, the house that will be built. Now the Nun is in the middle, and that Nun is the fruitfulness, and you have the hay on the end, that means light shining from the light, from the fruitfulness 
of the people within the household. And that's a, the symbolism of that word bana. And when you look at those collective, you have two letter bets, which are the two houses, the two sticks that will come together. You also have two nuns, the nun inside and the nun on the left, that's the nun's feet. And the two nuns is basically double fruitfulness, which is the meaning of the tribe of Ephraim, who is the tribe that represent the Christians or the Messianics or the followers of Mashiach will go out and the prophecy that was spoken over um, Joseph, he will be like a wild branch growing over the wall, going to the field, will do missionary work, and bring the nations inside this walled area, which is this house that is now being established um, with Jacob and this covenant when he saw the ladder lying on the stone. And then you have the hay, of course, the, the truth and the light shining. And that is Yahweh's Torah. And also the, the walk of the people walking in Yahweh's ways. Now the word ladder is the word sulam, samech lamet mem. And what you see there are um, two objects that are enclosed. The first one is the letter samech. And at the end, you get the letter mem, which is the enclosed mem. And they look similar. The one is just a little round edge. But they both represent cycles. And the samech, of course, means support, but it's a circle cycle and a cycle of elevation. And the mem is a cycle of cleansing, which is Yahweh's word. And in the middle, you have the lamet, that is the top part of. Jacob's ladder, but it also represents the shepherd's staff. It also represents learning and teaching, the function of the shepherd. So now we get another confirmation of what we read about in the Brit Chalasha and the function of Yeshua, the shepherd, and his sheep. We'll see the same symbolism with Rachel, who is a female shepherd, Rebecca being a female shepherd watering the animals at a well which is connected to a stone so everything is interlinked with one another and the woman normally represents the bride the collective bride and the function of the anointed ones within the household to water the animals which represent all the nations very 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 symbolic and the ladder is not designed for the animals it's designed for those who are the shepherds. They need to learn first, and then they need to teach. What do they teach? The thing that's on the left. The little cycle of cleansing, which is the mem. The cycle of the mem is also the Torah cycle. That's what they teach. And that's the ladder connection. You get the revelation from on high. You come down and you share it with the people on the left in the physical and then you also engage with the cycles of elevation which is your level of holiness like moses was a mountaineer um, abraham was one they go up to seek yahweh and to have that high level of relationship to bring down the glory and then share it with the people and teach them the ways of yahweh yeah so the latter is basically a picture of a teacher, a shepherd, yeah, so connected you, to Yahweh. If you take the letter, it's also um, spiritually representative of your DNA strand. It's written into your DNA strand. If you take this, um, 66 books in the Bible, there's 27 and 34. That's the number of the strand. This, yeah. this Jacob's letter goes in so deep. I promise you, people will literally have their mind blown when you go into mm -hmm. all this stuff. What's written in there, and the, the, the DNA of Israel mm -hmm. from this particular story. Yeah. Literally amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because this is the birth, the initial spark that started Israel. Mm 
yeah. is this event. Mm -hmm. And it started with the brokenness of Yaakov. Mm -hmm. And then he had this first encounter. And then there was another brokenness of Yaakov and his second encounter. And then Israel came into being after those two events. So this is the picture of Jacob's ladder. It consists of two words, or two letters. The Lamet, which is the tallest letter, and the Kuf, which is one of the letters that go down into underneath the line when you write it, that reach out into the lowest parts of the physical. And when you add the letter Bet as part of it, it makes the word Kebal, that means presence. And the presence of Yahweh appeared and was next to Yaakov, and that's what he experienced, was the word Kebal, which is the presence of Yahweh that included the ladder or the connection, the Kuf Lamet. Now what we see in the middle of Yahweh's presence is the house, that's the center of his presence. You have the letter Kuf, which reads down, but it's on the right, so it gives you access to what's on the right hand side or the spiritual so it's a spiritual doorway and you have the lament of on the left and that is not only your connection to yahweh but it is the function of the shepherd and the teaching of the people which then leads into leans into the left uh yeah kuf also means repentance back of the head and that is the entry point um, to enter the bottom part of this ladder mm -hmm. and to stop climbing it until you enter into the presence. Mm -hmm. So your first step is to repent, mm -hmm. come into the house, and then you need to learn the Lamet process in order to access the presence, which is the bed, which is the highest point. Now when you look at the word um, Kuf Lamet, it makes two words when you change the vowel points. First one is Kaul, that means light, and Kaul, that means sound. And those are the two mediums Yahweh used to reveal himself into the physical. Light is basically the word, is the light onto my path. Psalm 119, verse 105. And the sound is the means to speak the word into the physical, which can also then be written. So that is the, the two mediums. So they all harmonize perfectly with the concept of um, the words and also speaking things into existence and let there be light. We see the same two things at creation. So this is a, a creation moment. And this creation is the creation of Israel, the starting point of that. We are, we created the DNA of Israel. Yeah. Now, Messiah is also represented by the ladder. He is the voice that walked in the garden. He's also the word, the one that teaches. He is also connects us to the presence of the Father, the top part, which is the bed. And he gives us access to preaching repentance, which is the letter Kuf. So everything relates to Mashiach. The stone, the well, and the wife of Jacob. Genesis 28, 19, and 22. And he called the name of the place Bethel. And the name of the city was called Luz at the first. And the stone which I've set for a pillar shall be God's house. And for all you, for all that you shall give me, I will surely, surely give you a tenth unto you. So the phrase... And this stone is the word, is the phrase Baha Even, that um, means the stone. Now, what, what you see here is in the center, we've got the Aleph Bet, which is the word Av, that means father. So, within the stone, we see the father. We also see the Bet Nun, which is the Ben. And prior to that, we have the letter Vav and I which is the enlightened man that is now Jacob after his experience. So this stone was set up as a pillar. That's the second 
function of the stone. Firstly, to lay the head, head on it, have the encounter, and then that stone becomes the symbol in the physical, which is also related to the idea of an altar, which you set up to facilitate worship, whether it's a, a altar for remembrance, just something you see, or whether it's stones on which you sacrifice. They both represent worship and honoring the Father. And when you look at the, the combination of that, he called the place Bethel, which is Beth is house, and El is Elohim. This is the house of Elohim. And if you connect that to the word and the stone, which contain the word Av, you can say that this is the house of the Father, which links to his presence, which we saw earlier. Now, there's only one other place this word Va'aden is used and that's in Genesis 29 2 and that's where Jacob met his wife Rachel where this stone was over the well and this stone represents the building of the house the assembly which is the well so you can now say that a well represents an assembly that has the ability to give living water to the animals that come to drink and the function of the shepherd is to get the water from the well and offering it to the animals to drink. You can put the water in front of them, but if they don't want to drink, you can't force them. But you have the means to bring the water out and present it. And that's what we are supposed to do. That's how you go out and make disciples. You grab the water from the well, you bring it out and put it in front of them and see whether they're interested and thirsty enough to drink. And that's all we can do. So that's a, a beautiful picture of being a disciple of Mashiach or a shepherd. So Rachel was a female shepherd. And she brought a flock to the well. Rebecca was similarly a shepherd and she gave water to the camels of Abimelech. So if you look at the two, there's an a, a interesting connection. Now with Rebecca, um, there was great effort for Eliezer, so she had to, to water the camels, and they drank a lot of water, so it was a great effort. In Rachel's case, Jacob made the effort, and she was just there. Then Rebecca, he, she was recognized after her actions, and Rachel was recognized prior to, her, to his actions. The waters of Eliezer's was, um, uh, she had to water 10 camels, and Rachel, one flock, flock was watered by Jacob. Mm. With Rebecca, he consulted um, for her opinion, and Rachel was not consulted. Mm. Rebecca um, operated by faith, and Jacob had to work. Mm. So the one is faith, the other one is works. Mm. Eliezer gave her gifts and Jacob gave himself. Mm. Rebecca enters Sarah's tent and after seven years Jacob enters Rachel's tent. So what you can see here is that Rebecca represents the female or the bride. Rachel also represents the bride but Jacob represents Mashiach, the Messiah where he had to do the work, we have to believe. He will water your flock. You just need to bring the flock. He will make the effort through his spirit. He will convince them to drink the water. You just need to present them to the well or bring them to the fellowship, the household, or whatever the case is. And after seven years, Jacob enters Rachel's tent after the seventh millennium, we will enter into union, into the marriage covenant with Mashiach as the bride of Messiah. Beautiful pictures there in that. Rachel means female sheep or ewe and journey. So the sheep will be on a journey following the shepherd. And the shepherd is going to the place which is called the promised land. So salvation is not only 
an action, it's also a physical location. And if you want to know where the physical location is, it's right where the shepherd will be. You just follow him and you'll end up in the right place. You don't have to know where it is specifically. Just walk in his footsteps. Right. Um, oh, the other thing is the stone guarded the opening of the well. Something else guarded something else in the garden. The flaming sword guarded the opening of the garden that led to the way of the tree of life. And the way is the walk, the halakha, or the character of Yahweh that is embodied by the tree of life. And if you guard the way, you guard the culture of Yahweh, because that's his way. So that's also a beautiful picture of the stone. It's not there for people to defile the water. It's protected by the stone. And it's only Messiah will open it up and through his spirit will allow the flock to be watered. It's not supposed to be uh, diluted or um, made no, impure. You consider too, the stone was rolled in front of the tomb and it was sealed by the Romans so that the body of Christ would not come out. Mm -hmm. if that stone was rolled away, mate, <laughs> and he came out and he came out triumphant, mm -hmm. revealing himself as the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Nothing held him back. There's another symbolism. Yeah. The yeah. stone was rolled in front of the hole mm -hmm. so that the real image and body of the real Messiah may not be revealed and it was sealed by the Roman Catholic mm -hmm. Church mm -hmm. right. and they brought another image out mm -hmm. not the real mm -hmm. but now that stone is being rolled away and the real image of Messiah which is the Torah mm -hmm. is now being revealed <laughs> a lot of symbolism mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. with the stone mm -hmm. <laughs> When you read that portion there, it keeps saying how big the stone was. So you get the picture that the reason they only pulled it away once is because it takes more than one person to remove it. But Jacob sees his bride coming and he just, he just pulls it out and, yeah. you know, on, on his own. Yeah. <laughs> it was uh, one person. Mm. Uh, he had super abilities. <laughs> After his encounter, mm. he had the ability to and remove the stone. He watered her, her flock first. Mm. Yeah. And then the other animals came. <laughs> yeah. There's yeah. so much in there, isn't there? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> mm. All right, now for our olive bed letter. Guess what letter? Zayn. Sword. That means the sword and the word. Mm. That's also been part of our topic that relates to the water in the well and the essence of the covenant, which is Yahweh's Torah and his commandments. The flaming sword that protected the way. The flaming sword of Yahweh, the Torah, that protects the culture, the Hebrew culture, which is the culture of Yahweh. So there's a lot of things in there. So Zion is the seventh letter of the Aleph Bet, which is number seven, cycles of seven, which you also saw here. And it means sword. Zion is between the letters Vav and Chet. And it's as if the Vav man want to enter Chet, the life, eternal life, you need to access it through the Zion. So the, you need to interact with the Zion and number seven, the cycles of seven, in order to enter the Chai, eternal life or new beginnings. So that's symbolism within the Aleph Bet sequence, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. If they put the word Zion on the menorah pattern, it's Zion Yod Nun Sufit. And it's got the Gematria of 67. Now Zion is on the right. That means the spiritual sword of Yahweh and his word that guards the way to the garden. It's also the stone, symbolizing the stone guarding the opening 
of the well. It also has to do with the building of the household relating to the sword in that regard. I've already said all of that previously. In the middle is the letter Yod, which is the unseen hand of Yahweh, also the hand on the head, which then transforms the Vav into an enlarged Vav or a crowned Vav or anointed Vav, which is the anointed one. And that is found within the Zion, the word Zion, the anointing is embedded in there. Now, the Zion is the Gematra of 67. And that means pride, arrogance, vile, nothingness, worthlessness, ineffective, insignificant. So that's the starting point. That's Yaakov. And then Yahweh said, oh, let me grind you, crush you, because you are weight and you're too light, and my father is the judge. And then Jacob prostrated himself and started to worship Yahweh after his encounter. And then he started to gain understanding, discernment, and things that, are, that were concealed are now being revealed. And we have the word belly, that is the belly of reptiles. And that word is found in the center of the Torah, that word belly. So that points directly to the Torah. And it gives you the structure and the building. For Yahweh has built up, which all has to do with the house, the household in the assembly. And then you become normal, famous leader, captain, ruler, and the building of Elohim is made up of all those people. So that's within the Zion. And the sword is also used to cut you open. To remove things that is not of him and that's where my father is the judge and that brokenness function comes into play to change you from a Yaakov into a Israel yes yeah, so all of this um, perfectly fits the story of Yaakov mm. as well which is quite amazing mm. soul and yeah and that's yeah, Jacob Esau um, internal thing as well. Everything is connected. So let design. I've got a few things here which is interesting. The let design can be written by a hand upon the vav, which make it an anointed vav. As you can see there. So the nun sufit can be changed to a little vav with a hand on top of it. Just like you had the hand on the head of Bayera and the hand on the tzaddik of Bayetze. Now you have the hand on the vav within the word Zion. Now where that comes into play is you can write the word Yote vav like this, where the Yod is upon the vav. You have the word Ava in the, the bottom. We looked at that last week. What does that mean again? I can't remember. Ava. I think it means to reveal. Something like that. Um, and what this also symbolizes is that the word Yahweh, like I said last time, is his name that reveal a little part of who he is into the physical from our point of view for our benefit. So this word Yahweh is symbolic of Mashiach, the anointed man, the hand on the head of the Vav. And when we see Messiah, you see the Father. And that's what he told his disciples. Mm -hmm. And when you see Messiah, you see the Torah, the two letter Hayes. And that's all embodied within the word Yahweh, Yote mm -hmm. So Yeshua is Yahweh revealed to us as the mediator that we can interact with and not die. But beyond him is the consuming fire, which is the Father, the fullness of him that includes the Messiah as well as everything that is. The word, if, if you then swap out the Vav and the little Yod, 
into nun sufit, it makes the word hana, that means to behold. So behold Yahweh through Messiah. That is the, the ground one, the king, ground love, the king of kings. <coughs> Beautiful picture just found within that. And from here, if you want to put the hand on the head of the vav, you have to go through the chet. You have to face the tet, which is a serpent, and you have to have the sword in order to become an anointed vav. You have to overcome, overcome the serpent. You have to enter through the blood. You have to have the sword of the word in order to become a anointed vav. Amazing. Let's see. You can see Yeshua's work there coming back because of the letters from right to left. So going backwards that way, mm -hmm. going through the, the, the circle of back to man to redeem man. Yeah. And over here you see the small hand and the large hand. This is the hand of Yahweh. This cuff is the collective hand of the body or the household. And the spirit is the helper of the hand of man that now become the shepherds and the teachers using the word and then become the enlarged vows for the benefit of the people. So they are now the shepherds and the teachers using the word and that's where the hand comes in. So after you're crowned as a vav, to establish that, that's what you do, is to become a teacher of the Torah within the collective body. So that's just a few word plays on, on the sequence of the letters and the relation to the word Zion. The Zion not only means sword, it also means sharp weapon. And it's associated with the word Lezayin, that means to be armed. And that's where the armor of God comes into play, what that Paul's talked about. Now, the root word of Zion is also the root word of Mazon and Hazana, that means nourishment. And the root word for um, bread, Lechem, is also associated with the root words for Zion. So sword is now connected to nourishment and food and bread. So now we see that the word is the bread of life that nourishes us, but it's also the sword we can use as a weapon. It's one and the same thing. And it's also symbolic of the army of God that has the sword to make them strong, they have to eat the bread of his word. But the bread is also the sword, and that's where you use it for the same thing. Now, what's interesting in Psalm 119, verse 49 to 56, it's preceded by the, 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 the letter Zion. If you read Psalm 119 in, in the right translation, it starts with Aleph, and it's got a couple of verses, then Bet, a couple of verses. And at the end, when we're now at 49, it's got Zion. So let's see what the Zion in Psalm 119, 49 to 56 means. Remember the word of your servant, upon which you have caused me to hope. This is my comfort and my affliction, for your words is, has given me life. The proud have given me great derision. <coughs> Yet I do not turn aside from your Torah. I remember your judgments of old, O Yahweh, and I have comforted myself. Indigation, uh, it, it negation, indignation, it, indignation <laughs> has taken hold of me because of the wicked who forsake your Torah. Your statues have been my song in the house of my pilgrimage. I remember your name in the night of Yahweh and I keep your Torah this has become mine mm -hmm. so we saw last time the personal relationship now Yahweh is the Elohim of Yaakov 
Now we see that the Torah is a personal Torah. It's my Torah. I've taken ownership of it. It's not the Torah or Yahweh's commandments. It's my commandments that I keep that Yahweh gave me and I keep them personally. So that personified the Torah and that makes it that you actually take charge and hold of that sword. Now it becomes your sword that you use personally for your battles. It's not Yahweh's sword, someone else's sword or the sword of the word. It's your sword that's made up of the word and the Torah of Yahweh. And it's also your nourishment and your brain of life that you use to strengthen yourself as we see there so that's a beautiful picture as well related to psalm 119 and that is it thank you very much um, at the end of that portion something that um uh, struck me was when laban catches up with jacob Yaakov and, and says, Oh, you've got my daughters and all that, and I build that uh, stone between them. Laban actually um, sets up a, a curse if Yaakov takes any other foreign women to be his wives apart from the daughters, his daughters. And it made me think that. And he said, and Yahweh is the witness. And it made me think that then that's exactly what happens in the future. Israel does take up, you know, foreign women and, and all that, and has kind of called that curse upon us. Yeah. In a sense. So it's just mm. this um, prophetic, that, that whole picture at the end there is a prophetic picture. Of yeah, even within the family. There was only two original daughters. The other were slave women, oh, yeah. and their sons was part of the curse within the household. Yeah, yeah. And that's also prophetic of the conflict within the body of Messiah today, yeah. because of the foreign women's children who are now entering the household. Oh. The curse of, of Laban is now oh. playing out, oh. which is just the wisdom of Yahweh oh. revealing it. Yes. Because it will happen because of the diversity and the conflicts and the mm. difference of opinion. And it's only the Torah that can take that curse away to align them to stand on one foundation mm. and to be in unity. Because yeah. it used to think the women of the, of the children of Bilhar and whatever the other wife's name was, <coughs> they're accepted and become part of the 12 tribes, and yet the child of Hagar wasn't. Yeah, what's the go with that? I think it's because the the blessing of the stars that you won't be able to count was the pure form, the priesthood. And Ishmael was coming into play in that space. And that need to be removed. You can't have that in the priesthood. But within the sand of the sea, the larger household you can allow that because now you have a double tzaddik in order to handle this dynamic. You've got a double anointing. You've got the helper, the spirit of Yahweh to help you deal with this chaos. But up there it was just a single tzaddik, just a hand on the head. And you wanted to just have the priesthood anointed and keep that pure, keep the priesthood pure. Well, that was interesting too. With the fact in Revelation, when the 12 tribes were mentioned, there were some of those tribes that were omitted. And that was the tribe of Reuben, and the tribe of Dan, and the tribe of. Um, what's that? Manasseh, not Manasseh, there were three of them. That Levi, which wasn't supposed to be of that order, stood in for them. And in those tribes, when they were given, in their order, the 12 tribes, it says, as they were given, so you will know which tribe, this, this is talking, I mean, like way at the end of the time, 
which child you will actually be associated with through that order because it's going to be like a 12 day order of things as they give us first day there'll be 12 sealed 12,000 sealed 12,000 sealed 12,000 yeah, 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 yeah. but in that order you will know from which family you come only Yahweh knows it and he will seal you in that He'll see you within sequence to identify you as a know which order you which out you um, were from or represented from. Yeah. That was that shook me. Yeah. That really shook me. Oh, yeah. oh that's amazing. Yeah. 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 So much in me. Mm. A lot. In everything. And we only touched on that yeah. little bit. Yeah. Isn't the word for um, stone, Eden, isn't that also the word, for, is that the word also for servant? Yeah, I think it's related. And I think worship is also related to that. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we just see now the word come uh, that's the authority or the, the, the what's that, that time. And what have we got? What has spoken most of today? Who's controlling? The cabal. <laughs> <laughs> You've got it, my man. The cabal is here. They're sitting on the cookie at the prison now. They're going to be brought down. Mm. Mm. Any other last comments or questions? Mm. All right, then we can close in prayer. Mm. Father, what a wonderful time it has been just sitting with you to the word that you have presented us in your service. Lord, we praise you for this day. We praise you for what we've heard and for what we've absorbed and you've allowed us to take into our spirit. We do it in measure because you know how much we can take in and how much we can't. Father, one thing we do know, that what has been presented to us as a meal, we accept gladly with praise and worship and glory be to your name. Thank you for every wonderful word that has gone out, this bread of life that you have given us, which makes us authority over the enemy. Thank you for that. Thank you that we are more than conquerors over the enemy. Because of this glorious word, we praise you for the day, we praise you for the people, we praise you, Lord, for the food that we eat and the drinks that we take. We give you glory, honor, and praise in Yeshua's name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Amen.